Ever stood in an empty room and felt you weren't alone? Psychic investigator Andy Matthews has. I try and get to the bottom of the truth. And he's not the only one. I've gone all through my life, from a very young age, being aware of spirit. Something's down there. It's really a quest to find out the truth behind what happens to us whenever we pass over. An ancient settlement dating back to the 1600s. Some say the spirits of its past still reside here. I can't hear you. I hadn't actually ever seen anything until I started working in the barn. Oh, he doesn't like me up here. Get out, he's saying to me, get out. Something there we go. They believe. The question is, do you? Can you knock twice for me? No. Psychic investigator Andy Matthews is on his way to what's reputed to be the oldest haunted house in County Derry. I'm an evidence gatherer, um, so I'll collate and collect whatever evidence I can get through myself, through Marion, our medium, through our investigation team. I think Northern Ireland uh, is probably one of the most haunted places in the world. It's got a magical mystery about it, you know, the myths and legends. And it's just dripping with history. And I was really surprised, actually, how open to the paranormal the people are here. Because when you come across something that you don't fully understand, um, your natural reaction is to find an alternative explanation for it. Oh, that was me. <laughs> it happens. Balahi Bon, a former 17th century manor under state care for the last two decades, is one of the 12 original Ulster Plantation settlements. It comes from two Irish words, bow meaning cow and dun uh, meaning fort. And basically it, it functioned as a fortified courtyard. Somewhere you could retreat in times of warfare. With many of its original features still intact, the building is steeped in history. Some say the ghosts of Balahi's past still resonate in the walls. Andy is inclined to believe them. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, this place. It's loads of different buildings just added on. And with all the renovation work that's been going on over the years, you know, I wouldn't really be that surprised if it's disturbed certain energies within the building. So, yeah, we could be in for an interesting time here. Cara Stewart has lived beside the Bon all her life. She's not the only member of her family to have sensed something unusual here. We're doing a spring clean of the barn um, for an event that was taking place later in the week. My sister was in the round tower room. She just heard little court shoes coming behind her on the, the wooden floor. Um, she actually just uh, lifted her bits and bobs and <laughs> flew down the stairs. So it's you feel as though it was a woman, obviously, because of the shoes? Because that, of that the heard. shoes, yeah. Deep down, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, but I hadn't actually ever seen anything until I started working in the bond. I definitely believe that there's a presence in the bond, probably more than one. The office where Ivan Minnis used to work has been deserted for two years now. Uh, I'd be the education officer at BSQ. It's in what's known as the Wee House, a former 19th century nursery with a reputation that's far from innocent. A few strange incidents have happened in here over the years. Uh, one occupant said they came in one morning to find everything covered in dust and no clear evidence of where it would have come from. Another described uh, how they couldn't get into the room. There was The door wouldn't open. A chair had been jammed against the door from the other side. Jammed against the door? Well, uh, sort of got the door shut and it had been sort of jammed up. Jammed up against the door and they had to kind of edge in, moving the chair back and back. And again, the same occupant of the office at the time described how papers were rearranged. She'd left out a set of papers ready for a presentation and found them all scattered the following morning. And no windows open, nothing like that to explain that. Sounds like poltergeist activity. What's it been used for? Has it always been a family home? Or? No. I... 300 years ago, the house where the Sturt family now live was a red coat barracks attached to the barn. Poltergeist activity has never been reported here but according to Cara, another equally strange presence has visited. OK, well, the house was renovated in 1997 and um, we'd moved back in a few weeks. Um, I'd come in one, one night and I was washing my face 
when I saw the solid. Well, it was more solid than a shadow side profile of a man moving in that direction, okay? Um, but a few seconds later, the profile, it never the came shadow, back. <laughs> it, did, it did come back. And I saw the other side of the profile moving in this direction. And this wasn't frosted glass, was it? This is no, it can't be plain. because it's a listed building. All right. Yeah, so we can't have frosted glass. So it would have been a distorted image. This would have been something you could no, have seen clearly. No, this is something that I saw clearly. Um, I actually thought it was my brother. So when I saw it, I wrapped the window and I shouted, Frankie, I'll, yeah. I'll let you in now. And there was no answer. And it was then I realised that what I saw wasn't human. <laughs> and did you come out and investigate? Did anybody come no, out I and take not, a I did not. Not in your life would I come out at that time in the night to investigate, so, no. In the hope of contacting at least one of the Bond's many reported ghosts, Andy heads straight for the oldest part of the building, the tower room. Now, I had a kind of a feeling that there was somebody here when I walked in. As I looked to my left, I got a fleeting kind of image of a, a colourful dress just wafting past in my peripheral vision out the corner of my eye. I'm not saying it was a ghost. It could have been a trick of the light. It could have been light coming in from the window. But it didn't startle me. It made me jump back. So that's when I decided to take centre of the floor and sit there with the dowsing rods. Do you wish to talk to me? When you're doing paranormal investigations, it's very easy to take the scientific angle all the time, you know, plug something in and switch it on. I prefer sometimes to try a more human approach, and that's just simply ask. You know, and with the dowsing rods, um, or divining rods, or whatever you want to call them, it's... It's not conclusive proof of uh, spiritual contact in any way, shape or form, but it is an interesting device. The rods themselves are just a brass rod, as you can see, with a plastic handle which turns. So it's, it's very, very difficult, as you can see me here, trying to get them to cross. But it's... it's I'm not sure how it works, really, but it's... Give me a yes. There you go. Is there anybody here in this room and talk to me? Is there a lady here? Are you a child? Oh. There was some kind of energy or electromagnetic pull that was making them spin at that speed and as they were doing that I could feel the charges or like an electrical charge, like a static going through my body and also there was a great temperature drop on my back and then suddenly it stopped. It was as if the lady of the house came in and took the children out, just took them away. So that's when I decided to record the experiment on my digital voice recorder. Can you talk into this and tell me your name? Is your name Peter? Patrick? The name Peter um, first struck me. It hit me like an idea. You know, as you know, I did train as a medium once, and sometimes when you're walking around places, you pick up names that just pop into your head, and that's literally how it happened. I haven't reviewed the EVP session. It sounds like when I ask the boy ghost, if you like, is your name Peter? It sounds like he's saying no. The voice does... It's, there's some kind of sound there anyway. I need to get it checked with uh, uh, the Nips boys and get it analysed, but this is it. The house is a 400-year history, so there's obviously going to have been children here over the years. The Hill family we know had close to 30 children, of which I think 22 survived. And the Thompson family, who came into the house after them, they had nine children. They actually used the, the wee house as a nursery, and also the top floor of the tower served as a kind of nursery at another point as well. Setting up a base next door to the tower room, the Northern Ireland Paranormal Society immediately get to work analysing Andy's recording of what he's convinced is a child's voice. I can see a, a slight raise in the waveforms here, so 
it's going to be a difficult one, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So what I need to do first is bring the volume up a little bit to a level that I can I can work with. 84%. Yeah, you can definitely see it's becoming clear here. Uh, so we'll amplify that again. So you put that in context with your question. Sounds like something else. <laughs> it doesn't sound like no, does it? Well, I, I think you were right the first time. I think it is no. Get a little bit more noise out of it. Hmm. It's because it's a whisper. It's, uh, it's difficult to. But well, it's a, it's a voice. It's uh, definitely something there. And but... It's definitely in response to your question. I mean, I, I still think it sounds like no. It's yeah. maybe a little child, child's voice, even. Let's have a look at the next one. Are you here? Somebody's definitely there saying they're not here. No. <laughs> well, at least they gave us something, even if it wasn't no. <laughs> the message, if it is one, could indicate a refusal to talk. Fortunately, in this investigation, Andy's not the only one asking questions. Marion Goodfellow, the last member of the team, has arrived and already she's getting a sense of Balahi's past. Oh, strange place. Really, really strange place. can smell smoke, S flames, the stench of smoke and burning. Whether there was a catastrophe here or somewhere close by, I don't know. Marion's intuitions could relate to any period from Balahi's 400-year history. And yet her immediate sensation of fire and panic points to one very significant event that happened here in 1641, courtesy of rebel commander Sir Philem O'Neill. When the rebellion broke out, the rebels came here. Apparently, there was about uh, 200 horsemen uh, and soldiers surrounded the castle. And uh, a few days later, the rebels burnt the town and burnt the castle, and the poor settlers had to had to flee. Uh, most of them, I think, survived, but they lost everything. There was sickness. Maybe at some time in its life, it was. Uh home to the sick, like a hospital of some kind. Although, strictly speaking, it was never a hospital, medical operations were carried out at the Bonn by one Dr. Thompson, who lived here with his family in the early part of the 20th century. Dr. Thompson was a great man locally, saved many lives, and there are many anecdotes told about his doctoring skills and uh, his eccentricity at times when surgery was needed. The operations were carried out in one of the front rooms of the castle, but to supply light, uh, the surgeon's car uh, and the doctor's car, the only two cars in the locality, uh, were, were parked right up against the window and the lights left on. Well, it feels a bit better in here. <sighs> Lovely place. Not old. Female energy. It's a lady. I've got a really gentle soul here. Really gentle. She was here when the fire was here. Before then. She feels like she's been here forever. She's got such a lovely face. Grey hair pulled back. A few odd strands over her face.
I already sensed there were soldiers on the hill. And she's watching them come. Coming down the hill. She's got such sad memories, but happy ones too. There's no chance we'd ever get her to go anywhere else. She's here, and she's going to stay here. Marion may be sensing a presence at the Bon, but so far, that's all it appears to be. A presence without a voice. I really, really try to get somebody to talk to me, and I haven't, as yet, had anyone that will come forward and say, yeah, I know the place, I'll take you around, Marion, I'll tell you what's going on. In its day, the former nursery at the Wee House was used not only by children, but also by the staff who cared for them. I've got a soldier here. He's asking me what I want. I'm saying I don't want anything, I'm just having a look. He's an angry little man, full of his own importance. What is it about this place? Nobody wants to speak to me. Oh, he doesn't like me up here. He really doesn't like Get out, he's saying to me, get out. I'm, I'm not supposed to be up here at all. So I'm going. He said to me, don't you go upstairs, don't go up there. And I thought, to hell with it, I'm going up there. We're having trouble in this place. It, it, things are not coming forward to me. So, you know, yeah, I dared. It might have looked a bit disrespectful to the soldier. But, you know, we weren't getting an awful lot. So it was a matter of, you know, I'm going to push you. You know, come and stop me. Say something, do something. You know, I'm desperate here. At one time, there would have been lots of books, papers, strange. Yet it's been lived in. There's a family feeling here. I've got a small boy, seven, eight years old. Um, he seems to be hiding here, hiding up here. The little boy keeps coming closer and then going back. He's, he's so unsure of himself, so afraid. Did you live here? It's a bloody place, nobody's speaking. In order to coax a response from the ghostly youngsters he believes are reluctant to speak directly to the team, Andy opts for a different approach. Poltergeist activity, usually associated with children, is said to involve the unexplained movement of solid objects. Perhaps this is the key to communicating with them. Right, what I'm going to try here is a controlled object experiment. Now, the best way to do um, a controlled object test is to get some kind of object that matches the era or the past history of the building. What I've got here is a Balaki bottle. I don't know what was in it. Long since drunk, anyway. So what I'm going to do, I'll place that there. Now, the theory of this is that if this room is their safe haven, if you place a foreign object within that haven, then the possibility is if they don't like it, they'll move it. But first I need to check that the ground... No vibration will make it move. I need to mark it. I usually do this with chalk, but we can't obviously in this carpet. There we go. OK, the plan is we're going to leave that here overnight with all these cameras trained on it, and then we'll look at the footage in the morning. If it moves, we've got something that's quite amazing. If it doesn't, well, at least we tried it. The bottle hasn't moved. Well, worth a try. With no new leads, Andy turns to the archives in search of details that might help the paranormal team trigger a response. 
particularly the names of those who would have spent their childhood at Balahi Bon. Later that evening, the paranormal team set up a white noise experiment based on Andy's research. Just checking the sound in here for the microphone. Is that good, yeah? That's fine. Basically what white noise is, is a series of 20,000 tones being played at one time. I turn the volume up there, would you? Now, the theory is spirits don't have a voice box, so they're supposed to, to be able to manipulate frequencies. So what we're trying to do is give them that possibility. After the experiment, we are taking a series of photographs. The reason why we're doing that, because if there is, spirits are trying to communicate and they are leaving messages. They may be in the room. So we'd like to try and capture an image as well. When I finish the experiment, I'll turn the white noise off and that's your cue to go, OK? If there's anyone here, we ask that you come forward and talk to us. Is there any members of the Thompson family or the Hill family who wish to come forward? And you have anything to say, please say it. Please leave us a message. We'd very much love to talk to you. Basically, we turn the lights off um, because it may show up some light anomalies. Uh, we know that a lot of these light anomalies are dust and insects and uh, flakes of skin, uh, but there's some that we, we do find quite interesting. So we find if the lights are knocked off, we may capture these a lot more. I'm calling out to Minnie, Marion, Susan. We hope that the spirits are on the other side, they're listening to us, maybe if they hear their name a bit mentioned, or someone that they're uh, closely associated with, then hopefully we can draw them a bit closer to communicate with us. Susan, if you're here, can you please knock twice now? Can you knock twice for me now? OK, OK, have enough? Okay, yeah, no, good stuff. We'll get Mark to analyze that a bit later on. The following day, Darren and Mark have interesting news. One name, and only one, has triggered a response. I think it's something special. I think you just play it and let me say, go on. Susan? The name from the list I gave you, the people that occupied Yes, the we stuck with Susan because Mark was picking up through the microphones that we're getting some sort of response. And you didn't get any response with any of the other names? Absolutely nothing else. Susan was the only name that we seemed to be getting a response with. Can we run it again, Mark? Susan! But you haven't heard anything yet. Really? The next one I find extremely interesting. This is a first for us. A first? Oh, OK. Here's the question. Can you knock twice for me now? Okay, and here's the answer. Right, okay. Are you, are you sure, you know, you want your feet could tap in or something? I'm positive there was nothing else in the room that was making that noise. See the waveforms of the knocks, that's untouched. The volume hasn't been touched at all, and they're nearly as loud as the speech but yet heard nothing at the time. And you got to see, too, we're, we're watching here as well, so we can see it while it's happening. And Darren always says if there's a noise, if there's a car passing, if there's a knock, if the foot bangs, he always calls that out. There seems to be um, a bit of speech before the knock. There's, there's a question, then there's like a confirmation knock, then a little bit of speech, then the musical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. It's not, it's not a random kind of noise, is it? It's like a... It's kind of... It's like a little tune. In your face, knocking twice is a bit too simple for me, you know? Right. Can you knock twice for me? No. Oh. Sounds like somebody knocking on the door. Yeah. Mm. And it sounds like it's saying, look. Look, or... Do you know what I picked up? What? This sounds crazy. I think it sounds like you're a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> Can you knock twice for me? No. Oh. 
you're getting that kind of response just when you ask for the, well, when you say the name Susan. Yeah. I mean, we've had nothing really come through. Marion, you know, as she said, they just won't talk to her. So this is really the first real ghost that's here, if you like, that's willing to come forward and do something, or knock, or say, or whatever. When, when we do EVP experiments, yes, the odd time you do get the knocks, the ones, or the, the twos. Yeah, but I've had this, it's, it's very unique, it's very unusual to us. The name Susan that Andy found in the Balachi archives is that of a cook who worked for the descendants of Dr. Thompson. For 50 years, her home was the attic above the nursery in the wee house. And one of Balachi's locals actually remembers her. We're looking for information on a, a cook yes. that was at the Bourne. Yes. Her name was Susan, Susan Hurl. Susan Hurl. I, I knew her as wee Susan always. That's all over the corner. Wee Susan, so wee she Susan, was. Wee Susan, aye. She lived in the Bourne someplace, but what room in it, don't ask me. But I know, definitely know she stayed there. She was like part of the family all the days. And did she have any children at no, all? No. She never married? Never, I, never, I never knew nobody belonged to her. Can you describe what, you know, what she looked like? Just a small person, not too big, very tidy, uh. kept very tidy. She was just a wee backward kind of a woman, backward, you know, didn't make any money, people. And did you ever actually ever meet her? I never, I never was speaking to her that I mind of, but I saw her hundreds of times, because hundreds I, of times. I suppose back then, with it being a village, everybody knew each other, didn't they? They did, they did, aye, they did. Oh. We were out in that state, you see. We were up there. Do you believe in all this? Do you believe in ghosts? No. Couldn't, no. couldn't scare me. No. They're just stories to you. They're just stories to me. You couldn't scare me. No. Well, that was amazing. I mean, to actually find somebody who can tell you firsthand about the history that I'm researching up at Balaki Bourne. That's incredible. This guy's 66 years as a butcher, and he actually remembers Susan, the cook at Balaki Bourne. Fascinating experience, wasn't it? Balaki has been slow to give up its secrets. While Marion and Andy both claim to have sensed something of its presence, neither one has managed to make contact. I mean, there's plenty of uh, spirits that you've picked up on, but no information. What happened? I don't know. Um, the lady, certainly, that I picked up in the tower was definitely not the Susan. Mm. You know, um, she was from that earlier time. So, you know, she was here when the soldiers came, she was here when the fire... So, you know, we've got two different energies here. Well, what about the energies that are here, Mary? I mean, in other places we've moved some on. Do you think they need help, or are they quite happy enough no, to be here? No, not at all. They're quite happy here. There is no way that, you know, we should do anything other than leave them in peace. So, in this case, it's best really left alone? Absolutely. Leave them in peace. Yeah. I think I'll agree on that one. Andy and Marion believe that the walls of Balahibon still resonate with the spirits of the past even if those spirits remain silent. The question is, do you? And the final programme is next Wednesday night at the same time, 10.45. Big bucks on offer next tonight on BBC One Northern Ireland, but what price? The movie connections of a local hero. Ooh.